Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster doesn't need much introduction, but I want to say a couple of things in, in, of introduction because he's too modest to ever say them himself. Uh, H.R. is a recipient of a Silver Star. He's written two books of, of memoir. He never mentions it, so I'm mentioning it today. <laughs> As you, some of you know, H.R. was a army captain who fought uh, a, a particular maneuver in the first Gulf War that is still taught in army war colleges, which is in the space of 23 minutes, his troop that he commanded uh, destroyed 25 Iraqi tanks, uh, 80 Iraqi lorries, um, and it is seen as a classic example of tactical maneuver. Fast forward to the second uh, Iraq war, um, HR uh, went, it, went into a town called Talafar, which Al Qaeda in Iraq had taken over completely in 2005. In that town, uh, Al Qaeda was killing everybody and HR dispersed his soldiers into small outposts around Tal Afar and completely destroyed Al Qaeda in Iraq using a totally new technique. And somebody called Philip Zelico at the State Department heard about this and told it, mentioned the story to Congolese Rice and Clear Hold and Build became essentially the doctrine that helped turn the tide in the Iraq War, which HR was instrumental in producing as a colonel. Anyway. I'm going to talk to HR and we're going to have some questions. Um, he signed books, but he has to leave at 9.50. He has a 10.30A, a cell letter to New York. So <laughs> I will. <laughs> um, but the first thing I, I want to ask HR about, one of his goals when he was national security advisor was to be the funkiest national security advisor <laughs> in, in, in American history. Now, admittedly, the bar is pretty low because that's like being the most amusing North Korean intelligence official. <laughs> but, so, I mean, because if we think about uh, the, the, the average national security advisor, Brent Scrocroft. Right, not funky. Uh, Brilliant, but not funky, not that funky. Steve Hadley. <laughs> well, uh, Steve, he's a little funky. <laughs> Dennis McDonough. Not, not, not that funky. <laughs> Jake, Jake Sullivan. <laughs> not particularly funky. But it, that says something about you. You grew up in Philly, and you grew up in an era of what? Yeah, it was, it was one, the transition between, you know, Motown into funk, you know, remember, you know, the, you know, the Commodore's fourth album, I mean, I, I, you know, Earth, Wind and & Fire, and then, of course, Parliament Funkadelic, and, you know, yeah, I mean. <laughs> and H.R. can actually recite some of that. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, one of his, uh, one of his lines is, is, the other Clinton. You know, I, 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 sometimes when I give it a talk, I'll, I'll end with a Clinton quotation. People are like, oh, really? You know what? But of course, I'm, I'm talking about George Clinton, a far, Parliament Funkadelic, and <laughs> who, who was really, I mean, a kind of a stoic philosopher, right? And, and the, the line I like the most, because it applies to us these days, is, if you don't like the effect, don't produce the cause, you know? <laughs> and uh, anyway, <laughs> situation is just that. It has no power over you. It sounds like, it sounds like Epictetus to me, you know? <laughs> H.R., you, you just came out with, a, with uh, At War With Ourselves, which I think is a book that operates on two levels. First of all, being in the Trump White House and then the polarization we have in American society. Uh, it's number two on the New York Times bestseller list, so congratulations on that. Um, I mean, what, 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 what do you want people to take away from the book? Well, Abe, hey, thanks, Peter, and thanks, Anne-Marie and Jim, for the opportunity to be here. I really, I love this partnership. It's fantastic, you know. Uh, policy and analysis married with education, that's what we need more than anything. And it's relevant to the theme of the book, which is, hey, I think what we really need to do these days is to try to understand better the most significant challenges and opportunities we face, come together for meaningful, respectful discussions about those challenges and opportunities, and then work together, you know, work together within our nation and with, you know, with our strategic partners and allies ar around the world to build a better future for generations to come. And so the title, At War With Ourselves, is, you know, it's just elusive the fact that we're at war with ourselves because of the vitriolic nature of the partisan discourse, political discourse. And, and one of the themes in the book is how that's just bad for our psyche, you know, for, within our society. But it also really affects governance in a profoundly negative way also. So, so that's one of the themes for the book. The other is, you know, I just wanted to answer some basic questions like, hey, what was it like serving in the Trump White House, you know? <laughs> what the heck does a national security advisor do, you know? Um, <laughs> You know, how can you at least try, you know, to tra which I believe we did, to transcend kind of the, uh, you know, the vitriol and the, and the power games and the, 
you know, the pettiness that you see at times, you know, in, in this city in particular. <laughs> I mean, I'm in California now, man. I went, I, went, I went pretty far away. You know, I've got an ASU affiliation. I mean, I got, you know, went out, I went out west. But, uh, but, you know, I think we all have to do our best to try to transcend all that and, uh, and, and try to get some good work done. So really the, the, the arc of the book, if there's an arc through the story at all, is how privileged I felt that, that I was to, to work with some, you know, e extraordinary people. I see Chris here, you know, and members of the NSC staff uh, to, to try to help a disruptive president, President Trump, you know, uh, disrupt what needed to be disrupted and help adv advance American interests. So, and I think we did that in that in that first year. The story is a bit uh, as well about like how, you know, how I got used up in that process. And, and I was at peace with that, you know, and, and I believe that any job that you have, certainly in the Army, overall, in the military, uh, National Security Advisor, the job is bigger than you, right? So, um, and I, I hope that what comes out of the book is not, a, oh, how hard was that, but uh, what a privilege it was to serve, and that despite, you know, all the challenges we faced, I think we made a positive difference in that, you know, 13 months, or as I say in the book, the 41.3 Scaramucci's that I served for. Yeah, because that became, <laughs> that became, that became a, a unit of measurement for those of us who, who uh, who served served in the Trump White House? As you remember, House. Scaramucci <laughs> served for 11 days. So you served for 41.3 Scaramucci's. Congratulations. <laughs> um, I think an, a, an important point about uh, HR's career is you never voted while you were in uniform. Right. And also, you were in uniform when you were in the White House. When you went down to Mar-a-Lago to be, you know, to be, yeah. you weren't asked to be National Security Advisor. Right. Your Commander in Chief was sort of ordering you. Well, well yeah, but uh, <laughs> I would have done it anyway. You know, right, yeah. I, you know, I, I mean, I, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, the call came out of the blue. I mean, I was, I was walking down Walnut Street in my hometown of Philadelphia on, a, on President's Day Friday and got the call to interview at Mar-a-Lago. They, they said, can you be there on Saturday? I wound up going on Sunday. Interviewed on Sunday. Had a second interview on Monday. I knew there had been a down selection, but I didn't know who else the other candidates were until I ran into John Bolton in the men's room, you know. <laughs> How was that? It was, it, was, it was just it was a brief greeting, you know, ambassador general, you know, and then, uh, and then he, was, he was on his way out. I was on my way in. Uh, Trump, Trump hired me that Monday of President's Day. I flew back on Air Force One. I didn't live in Washington. I lived in Tidewater, Virginia at Fort Eustis. So they flew me home on. I don't know why it took two Ospreys to fly me, but two Ospreys flew me home. And then uh, and then uh, then I packed the bag, flew back to Washington the next day, Tuesday, and started working the West West Wing, you know, so it was. Uh, Pretty quick. <laughs> so, um, pretty quick. You know, your book is unsatisfying for two groups of people. One, Trump is the worst thing that ever happened in, in yeah. history, uh, or, or Trump is the best thing that ever happened in history. I mean, so <laughs> let's talk about some of the things that he got right when, while yeah. in your tenure. Uh, let's start with the, the Syria. Tell us, tell us what happened. Well, you know, for, for on, on the Syrian civil war and, and the Syrian yeah. strikes. So I yeah. tell the story, you know, the title of this chapter is A Well Oiled Machine. Really? Do you remember when, <laughs> remember when President Trump said, "Hey, the White House is a, it's a well-oiled machine"? But, but uh, you know, we what, we had, uh, we actually had a great team. You know, Chris was part of it. So many, so many uh, others. Joel Rayburn I saw last night, and and um, and and what we did in that one week period of time. This is the first week in April of of of, uh, of 2017. I think was extraordinary, just based on the degree to which it involved a heck of a lot of multitasking. So if you, if you might remember, you probably wouldn't remember, but, but the first week in, in April was when President Trump was going to meet with Xi Jinping for the first time at, at Mar-a-Lago. And so we were kind of in a race, you know, to, to try to lay the foundation for a new approach to China and, and, and uh, to have a new sort of at least the outlines, the foundation of a, of a, uh, of a, of a China policy in place. So a, a couple of weeks before the Mar-a-Lago summit, we held what we called a principal small group framing session. It's a, it was a new meeting that we put into place, uh, one of the principal's committee meetings of the National Security Council, and that was designed just to frame the complex challenges we were facing, to apply design thinking, you know, to our, our, our problems. And I, 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 you know, I brought this with me from my research and writing about the Vietnam War and my realization that, hey, and the, in, during the time uh, during which uh, you know, Vietnam became an American war, Lyndon Johnson, as principal advisors, hardly talked about, well, okay, what's the nature of the problem, you know, in, in South Vietnam? So, so in this framing session, we laid a new foundation for China policy. That was ongoing when, uh, when uh, the Assad regime committed another uh, episode of mass homicide uh, against the Syrian people uh, using the most heinous weapons on earth, you know, sarin gas. 
think, killing hundreds of people, uh, scores of children. And remember, this was, the, this was the red line that President Obama had established 2013 to 14 and had never enforced, right? So, so now we brought this to the president. The evidence was mounting. It was clear that, that the Assad did this and, and did it you know, with the knowledge and aiding and abetting of the, of the, uh, of the Russians. Um, president Trump sat for a National Security uh, Council meeting uh, before going to Mar-a-Lago to host Xi Jinping. He asked some questions. We didn't have the answers yet to some of those questions. And so I scheduled a subsequent meeting at Mar-a-Lago as, as, as soon as we got there. And I tell the story about this, and there's some pretty fun, there's, I hope you know, readers will laugh a little bit in this book. You know what? So, but uh, but you know, <laughs> there's nothing like sitting in like a top secret little tent you know, uncomfortably squished next to President Trump, you know, so I, that's what, that's the situation I was in for this meeting. And, and, and HR, describe the tent, because it's actually kind of an important point. Like, what do, what do these tents do? So what they, what they do is they, they, they uh, there's outside the tent, there's noise, and so it's dampening, and you can't, so if, if an, an, an enemy, an adversary, were trying to collect on you, it's just another layer of security, right? So, so we uh, did a video telephone conference, secure video telephone conference, back to the situation room, um, Vice President Pence, who is phenomenal, I in, in my view, uh, as Vice President, he's on the other end um, uh, in the situation room. And we asked the president's questions. The president, you know, the president then is ready to make a decision. And, you know, he's, he's, he has this strange thing about, like, not trusting communication systems. So uh, he said, well, we, we need to go somewhere else to talk. So it was just a small group of us, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Ross, who had wandered into the tent, you know, was, was like, you know, not really on the roster to be there, uh, and and uh, and, like, and a couple other people. So then we, so instead of the secure facility, we walked across the hall to the to the men's room, to the men's room, and that's where, and that's where the final decision was made. So it's, but it, but the but the main point of the story is that there was a heck of a lot of concurrent activity. Right as that was going on, the president hosts Xi Jinping. And, and, and the team was working very well together. It was, I think, a, a very good, I think, experience for all of us, kind of a bonding, team building almost a, a experience for us. Uh, but I think in that, in that you know, one day period, uh, what we had done is, is try to restore deterrence in terms of the use of, of chemical weapons. That was our, you know, it was the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, right? And now we're, we don't want chemical weapons to be normalized again. And then also to try to affect uh, the, 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 uh, the Assad regime's capacity to continue these serial episodes of mass murder. Um, and, and then at the same time, we did lay a, a, a completely new foundation, I think, for our approach to China based on our challenging of the assumption that China, having been welcomed into the international order, would play by the rules and as China prospered, the CCP would liberalize its, its economy and then ultimately liberalize its form of governance, okay? We, we rejected that. We said, okay, that's no longer the case. And I think we, we put into place almost a 180 degree shift um, in, in U.S.-China policy, I think the most significant shift in U.S. foreign policy uh, since the end of the Cold War. And you wrote that national security strategy, oversaw it. Um, interestingly, the Biden-Harris team have more or less, A, continued the strategy, maybe even amped it up. Yeah, well, again, again we, just, we had a fantastic team. Uh, Dr. Nadia Shallow, who was our, uh, a, a, our you know, uh, director for strategy, convened the departments and agencies together, but also engaged with New America, engaged with all the think tanks, and really, I think, laid, you know, set a collaborative effort uh, because what we wanted to do is we wanted Americans to buy into this strategy. We wanted everybody to understand really some of these significant shifts. And, 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 and I, if there's one theme through that whole strategy, it's the theme that we had some unrealistic assumptions, uh, at least in retrospect, uh, about the, about the post-Cold War period, right? And those assumptions involved really maybe this belief that an arc of history had guaranteed the primacy of our free and open societies over closed authoritarian systems, right? Great power competition and rivalry was a relic of the past. A, a condominium of nations would emerge in the post-Cold War period, and we would work collaboratively and cooperatively to solve global issues, right? And, and, then, and then ultimately, um, another one of these offshoots uh, assumptions was that that our, that our technological prowess, our technological military prowess would guarantee our security you know, well into the future. So that national security strategy is in some ways just a rejection of those, of those assumptions and then, and then really brought into it uh, as the basis for it a set of new assumptions about the world. The world's a competitive place, right? There is no such thing, I mean, don't want to offend anybody, as an international community. It's a figment of our imagination, right? It doesn't exist. We would like it to exist, but it doesn't exist. So it was very, it was, it was, it was very realistic in that connection and made the argument that we have to re-enter arenas of competition that we had vacated 
based on some of these flawed assumptions about the nature of the post-Cold War world. And so I, I think it was an overdue shift in policy, uh, but I think maybe this is, again, one of the things about, you know, President Trump, he's disruptive, you know, but, but there were things in Washington, in my view, that needed to be disrupted at that time. Now, he's also so disruptive that he disrupts himself, you know, <laughs> and becomes the antagonist in his own story. And so that's also a, a theme in, in the book. Yeah, but, you know, the Biden-Harris mm -hmm. administration kept the Chinese tariffs. In fact, they amped them up, 100 yeah. percent tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles, uh, and, you know, uh, and so, I mean, it seems to be a feature of American foreign policy that is. Absolutely. I think so. And, and I think the Biden administration deserves a lot of credit for that in terms of, uh, you know, in refining uh, some of the application of the tools of economic statecraft. I th think it's still inadequate. I think we have to do much, much more. Uh, we've seen even more and more evidence these days with the threat of, of Chinese embargoes on, on critical materials and, and minerals and so forth that we have been too complacent in allowing the Chinese Communist Party to gain coercive power over our economy. And, and the fragility of our supply chains, I think should be like almost issue number one uh, for any new administration. Uh, and the associated problem of the degree to which our industrial base is atrophied and how we've recognized now with the, the Ukraine war and, the, and how difficult it is just to manufacture, you know, artillery shells, you know, let alone uh, more sophisticated weaponry, uh, that, that we have a lot, a lot of work to do uh, to, to make those supply chains more resilient, invigorate our industrial base, and to try to do that through the appropriate incentives, right, rather than, you know, we know, and I'm, you know, from the Hoover Institution and ASU, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, Milton Friedman and the Hoover Institution, I mean, the, the walls would crack at Hoover if I advocated, you know, a heavy-handed industrial policy and the state, you know, the state becoming the allocator of resources. I think we have to think about how do we incentivize it, right? I mean, multi-year contracts for the Department of Defense, for example, to send the right demand signal to the defense industry, which we know, you know, these are not charitable organizations, right? <laughs> so, so we have to, uh, we have to really, I think, work hard at this, and and we're already behind, right? It's already a crisis. One of the things I'm concerned about is the is the Biden de defense budget, which would be a, a real reduction in defense spending at this moment, really. I mean, so I, I think we, you know, the, the 1930s analogy can be overdone. But I do think what George Marshall said about that period of time is really appropriate to today, which is, hey, when you have the time, you don't have the money, and when you have the money, you don't have the time. And so we're, we're already behind, uh, and, and it's much cheaper, you know, to, to prevent a war than to have to fight one. And, uh, and I think we have a lot, of, a lot of work to do to strengthen our defense, and that, of course, as I mentioned, that entails as well making supply chains more resilient and invigorating our industrial base. You know, you mentioned Vietnam earlier, your first book, which was your PhD at uh, UNC, uh, Dereliction of Duty, which is um, an amazing book. I mean, I'm going to summarize the argument, and, I, and then I want to see how it applies to the Trump White House. I mean, the argument is basically the generals and people like McNamara basically told John Lyndon Johnson what he wanted to hear, yeah. not what he should have heard <laughs> or needed to hear. So you go into the White House, you've written a whole book about people being told what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. How did that inform your time? And obviously, on the subject of Putin, you were telling some a bunch, President Trump a bunch of things he wasn't particularly happy to hear. Sure. Yeah. So, well, you know, it was quite, kind of a surreal feeling. I read about this in the book. I mean, I, you know, I had criticized the decision-making process during the Johnson administration, and in particular the role of George Bundy, who was running that process. And and then you know, I walk into the West Wing on that Tuesday, and now I'm in charge of the process I criticized from the. You know, from the, the way, story, didn't you, know, you so. take wasn't the same office as McGeorge Bundy? Yeah, you? I think so. I think so. <laughs> yeah, for, for, they call it the Kissinger Suite, but I think it, is, okay, I think well, it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but you know, so now it's like okay, you know, smarty pants. You know, <laughs> now, what, now, what are you going to do di different from that from uh, from that from that uh, that period of time I wrote about? So actually, you know, I took out a legal pad and I wrote down the five the five things that mistakes that I would try to avoid, so I would at least make new mistakes as a national security <laughs> advisor, not the old ones. And, and the first of these was to take more time thinking about the problem, which, as I already mentioned, the principal small group framing session was part of that. The second w was to establish clear goals and objectives. I mean, George Bundy had said, hey, it's better not to have an objective in Vietnam, because that way, if we don't accomplish it, it will give the president, quote, more flexibility in the domestic political arena. Okay, so that didn't make sense to me. So we'll establish clear goals and objectives and, and get the president to approve those as part of that framing process. The third was to, to challenge assumptions. I, I had noticed that there were a lot of implicit assumptions that had underpinned 
our approach to Vietnam. And because those assumptions were implicit, they were never really challenged. So what I, what I endeavored to do with, you know, as I mentioned, the, the China small group framing session with North, the North Korea, uh, which also was an early uh, set of, of principles meetings, was to, to make those assumptions explicit, challenge them, and then, sh and then propose a new set of assumptions and make those explicit. So everybody understood those. And then if we fell out of those assumptions, we could reframe, you know, the, the policy approach. Uh, the fourth key thing was to always provide multiple options. You know, I had taken this from my own research, but also Peter Robbins' fantastic book, uh, Presidential Command. And, uh, and, and, uh, and then finally, I would try to, to wall off the development of, of policy options for the president from partisan political concerns, right? So I took certain measures to, to affect all of these. Yeah, good luck with that, right? I well, I mean, Steve Bannon was on the NSC. Right, and, so the, you, and you, I removed him from the, the, the principles committee of the, of the uh, NSC. Um, that was one aspect of that, yeah. That effort. Uh, you call him a fawning court gesture. Yes. Yeah. Are you were being polite. Yeah, I was being polite. I was being accurate. <laughs> I was being. I could have been. Yeah. Could have been worse. Yeah. Been worse. Um, you uh, you have some great scenes in the book. Uh, Oval Office meetings, which you describe, I think, as exercises in, exercises in competitive psychophancy. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, this are, these are some of the early some of the early meetings, you know, and. And what I noticed is that, you know, the people were trying to curry favor with the president. I mean, I think there are, I read the book that there are really three types of people who serve in any White House. I think this is true of any administration, right? There are people who are sworn federal officers, you know, military, civilian, uh, who, who are, are dedicated to their careers, or they come in as political appointees, but they understand their role. And, and I almost used a, an epigraph for the book, but my editor talked me out of it from Epictetus, you know, this is what is most important, to play well the role assigned you, right? And so I think your role, if you weren't elected, right, is to provide the elected president multiple options and best analysis. So I think that's one group of people who are motivated to do that, right? To help the president uh, kind of determine his or her, her own agenda uh, and then his or her, make her, his or her own policy decisions. There's a second group of people, though, who I think come in to the White House or an administration broadly because they have their own ideas, right? They want to advance their own agendas. And there's a third group of people who kind of define the role of saving the country and the world from the president, right? And the problem with those two latter group, groups of people is nobody elected them. And not only are they not serving the president well, they're also undermining the Constitution of the United States. Because if, if we believe that sovereignty lies with the people, right, they're undermining you know, who the people selected, essentially, to be the president. And it's, it's the American people, it's Article One in the Congress and Article Three in the judiciary. Those are the checks on presidential power, not, you know, not appointees or bureaucrats within the government. This this theme of te not you know, um, telling people what they don't want to hear. I'm going to quote from your book. You told, you felt it was your duty, quote, to tell uh, President Trump that Vladimir Putin was quote was not and would never be Trump's friend. Then you added, he's the best liar in the world that he would try to play President Trump, manipulate him with ambiguous promises of a better relationship. Right. How did that go down? It went down exactly like that. I mean, that's what Putin <laughs> does. I mean, Putin is, a, you know, of course, everybody knows, like, he's, a, he's, he's the best operator, you know? And, and, and what, I, what I would try to do is, is, you know, President Trump would respond well to, you know, to, to this idea that everybody before him was kind of a chump, you know, or like it was, was you know, had, had fallen into the trap. So, but uh, President, President, Trump's desire for a better relationship with Putin was motivated by his desire to have some kind of an entente where they could work together and solve some of the biggest problems. I mean, it was a genuine desire to address, for example, you know, strategic stability and maybe even reduction in nuclear arms. Or to, you know, there were all sorts of issues that that President Trump wanted to advance with Putin. And I, but what I was trying to explain to him is that Putin's not going to sign up for that. He's only going to string you along so he can advance his own objectives, which were tactical, which, you know, sanctions relief, he wanted that more than anything in the near term, but he also wanted this out of Afghanistan, out of Syria, right? And, and, uh, and, and he would play to Trump's sort of reticence or skepticism about sustained military commitments abroad. You know, what are you doing? You know, and he would play to his belief that it was a mistake to invade Iraq in 2003, to Trump's belief. And so, so therefore, we had caused all these problems in Syria, and then we're the cause of the continuing cycles of violence, you know, rather than the Iranians and, uh, other, you know, and, and jihadist terrorists uh, and so forth. So 
he, he, would, he would try to you know, influence President Trump that way. And I just tried to warn him by placing you know, what Putin was doing to, to Trump in context of what he did with George W. Bush, remember? Remember he let his crucifix dangle out of his shirt, you know, and when President Bush asked him about it, he told him this story about it. it's his grandmother's, you know, and the house burnt down and it was like the last day. I mean, you know, and, 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 Pres and, and then President Bush said he looked into his soul. The soul guy really cares about, right? And then President Obama, right, the reset policy, really? I mean, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and leading over to Medvedev, remember, saying, hey, I'll have more flexibility after the election, trading off missile defenses for Poland. and exchange. So... I, I would, would go through that with him to say, hey, you know, don't don't fall for it. Your two predecessors fell for it. They they wised up by the end of their administrations. You know, why don't you just start at learning from their experience? You know. Yeah, and of course, um, uh, Georgia invasion 2008, Ukraine invasion, Crimea 2014. It would like the statute of limitations had expired. Right. It's, the pattern was clear. Right. And if you if, if you missed it, just like read this. You know, read his uh, eunuch speech from 2007. You know, I mean, he just laid it out. You know, so. I, so uh, and what I would try to explain, this is really, I, this in, my, in my previous book, I use this term strategic narcissism to, to describe like kind of our tendency to assume that what we do or choose not to do is decisive toward achieving a favorable outcome. And what that does is, it's both self-referential, but it doesn't really acknowledge the agency or the influence or the authorship over the future that the other has, including our enemies and our, our rivals and adversaries. And so Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, the supreme leader in Iran, right? I mean, Kim Jong-un, they all have aspirations that go beyond anything that's in reaction to us. So with Putin trying to allay his security concerns, that doesn't matter. He wants to reestablish the Russian empire, right? And so, so I think we have to uh, you know, apply what Zachary Shore, my, my friend and fantastic historian, calls strategic empathy. You know the the uh, the effort to to view these complex challenges from the perspective of the other, and, and to pay particular attention to the ideology and the emotions and the aspirations that drive and constrain the other. You know, uh, speaking of which, when David Sanger went into Putin's office, it, there wasn't a bust of Stalin or Lenin or you know, it was Peter the Great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, well, that. Fiona Hills called him you know Catherine the Great without the hoop skirt. <laughs> I think it's perfect. You know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned Afghanistan. Obviously, you uh, you had one view. The president had another view. You took uh, you you were a strong advocate of a con look look where we are today. The Taliban was it just two weeks ago banned the women's voice, voices, the voices of yeah. women in public. So you know they they they're like Taliban. They're like that they're, they're much better armed version of the previous version of the Taliban. They we left 8.5 billion dollars of equipment there, according to the UN. Uh, you know, unfortunately, they're a reality. We'll talk about this later today. Um, I mean, where were you on August the 15th, 2021, when uh, the Taliban yeah. took Kabul? What was your reaction? Well, I was just, I was just heartbroken, but of course I knew it was going to happen, you know, and, and uh, you know, I've, I've not said this publicly. I mentioned it just on your podcast when it comes out next, next week. Uh, I wrote to President Biden in, in the spring of 2021, and I said, hey, I'm not writing to you because I'm going to ask you to reconsider your decision about getting out of Afghanistan. But I'm, I'm ready to alert you that I think if you don't do these six things, it will be an unmitigated disaster in Afghanistan. Uh, the administration chose not to do any of those six things. Uh, I had conversations with senior people in the administration right before the deadly attack on, uh, on Kabul airport, uh, at, you know, a few days before that maybe, saying, hey, this is really going to be terrible. Um, and the question I was asked back is, well, what would you do and I said, we have a thing called an MLAT, an operation we're prepared to do to seize an airfield. We need to take back Bagram, establish a humanitarian corridor to Bagram. But that would take more troops. So I said, yeah, of course it would take more troops. But we're like, what, how does it make sense to evacuate the military before you evacuate civilians? Since when is, is that you know, something that, I mean, so it was, so I, I, in, the, in the book and, and publicly, I, I've really you know, placed blame on both administrations. I mean, it was, President Trump, who sent Zal Khalilzad essentially to surrender to the Taliban. I don't know how else to say it. It was a surrender, you know? Uh, so it's when do you negotiate with a terrorist organization without the, without the Afghan government present, really? I mean, even the Obama administration, when it got out of Iraq in 2010, didn't negotiate with al-Qaeda in Iraq, <laughs> you know, on the way out. Uh, and then, and then the, you know, the whole series of actions in terms of constraining our support, you know, uh, uh, reducing our support, 
uh, for the Afghans in terms of intelligence and air support, removing our aircraft from there, our logistics support, forcing them to release 5,000 of the most heinous terrorists on earth. I mean, I mean, I could just go on and on about like what they did to actually partner with the Taliban against the Afghan government. I mean, I don't know how else to describe it, you know? And so, so both administrations at blame, but I think the, you know, the, the, the utter incompetence of, of August of 2021 um, and, and just the, the humiliation of it, uh, the, the, the human loss of what, 170 Afghans, I think, as well as, uh, as, well as, as, as 13 American servicemen and women, you know, I think you can draw a direct line from that to Russia's reinvasion of, of, uh, of Ukraine uh, in, in February of 2022. I think Putin's like, okay, they're done. Read the joint statement between Putin and Xi Jinping in January, of, right before the Olympics of, of, uh, of, of uh, 2022. 20, uh, Basically, the message is, you're over. We're in charge now. Get used to it. That was the message to the world, you know? And I think that was directly related to the fact that we surrendered to a terrorist organization. And we had deluded ourselves to such a degree. You, you alluded to this already, Peter. I mean, think about what we heard, right, from the administration, both administrations, but especially from the, from the Biden administration. Hey the, hey, the Taliban, they'll, they'll share power, you know, right? I mean, actually, Khalil Zad and others, they were working on a power-sharing agreement with, you know, Karzai, who was delusional and I think was probably drugged by the Pakistanis and lost his mind. And then, and then, and then, and then, uh, and, and, and then, and, and, and you know, so, the, so that, that, was, that was a delusion. They're, you know, they're going to be nicer, you know, the, the Taliban, right? I mean, they'll treat women better. And then, but the worst of all was like, there's, there's a bold line between the Taliban and other jihadist terrorist organizations. I mean, I think, what is it, 15 provinces now in Afghanistan? that have terrorist training camps in them now, either of, of the ISIS or Al Qaeda variety. So, you know, I, I think this was, this was an astonishing degree of self-delusion. I mean, and we have to really examine this, and this is something New America might want to take on, is the degree to which our intelligence community is influenced by policy preference. The first paper that I asked for, a framing document for our deliberations on what became the South Asia strategy, which Trump should get credit for, you know, making that decision in August of 20. 17, sadly, he abandoned it a couple years later. But the first paper I got from the intelligence community, I wrote across the top of it in a bold Sharpie, did we outsource this paper to the Taliban? I mean, it described the Taliban through all these, with all this delusion. I was like, man, it's, it's extraordinary to me uh, the degree to which the IC bought into the, you know, to, you know, I don't, I don't know, the, uh, the, this, uh, you know, romanticized view uh, of the Taliban. Um, you're fond of uh, quoting Thucydides, uh, you know, fear, honor, and interest is why countries go to war. I mean, it's a sort of somewhat tragic view of history, I mean, in the longer term. Um, and what, what is your view of history? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, what we neglect oftentimes and what gets us in trouble is we neglect continuities in the nature of war. So, and, and, and really continuity is just in, in the human experience oftentimes. I think because we're Americans, which is a good part of our culture, you know, we're, we're always trying to affect change. We're thinking about the future. We're enamored with technology and technology's effect on fill in the blank, but warfare uh, and so forth. And when we neglect continuities is when we get into trouble. You know, the, the great historian Carl Becker, you know, he said that memory, uh, you know, <laughs> memory of past and anticipation of future should walk hand in hand in a happy way, you know? And, and Sir Michael Howard, in his fantastic essay, The Use and Abuse of Military History, says that we should study, you know, history, military history in particular, in width, depth, and in context, right? In width, so you can see changes and continuities over time. In depth, because you understand the complex causality of events and the tidy outlines of history kind of dissolve when you look at really how, uh, how you know, how multi-causal, uh, uh, you know, problems are uh, or how they're related to so many uh, uh, causes and you get a sense of, of the limitations on your degree of agency. Um, and then in context, in context of our society, our political system, popular will, you know, and the, the need to educate the population about your policies because, you know, you'll get the policy that the American people support ultimately, especially if you're looking at, you know, increases in defense, for example. The American people have to understand, you know, why that's necessary. So uh, I think, you know, I think obviously, you know, predictable for an historian, I'm going to say history is important because it helps us, you know, <laughs> understand the present and, and make a grounded projection into the future. Um, yeah. 
Would you work in the Harris administration? You know, I, I would work in any administration where I felt like I could make a difference. And I, I don't think any of us really know what, uh, what Vice President Harris's policies will be now. You know, if they're a continuation of the Biden uh, policies, Biden administration policies toward the Middle East and toward Iran, I think that would be a disaster, you know. If they're a continuation of the Biden administration's approach toward China, I think that's good, you know. Um, Ukraine. Uh, on, on Ukraine, good, 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 except for this meeting out of, of assistance to, to the Ukrainians, the incremental approach. And then broadly, and I have a piece out today in the free press on this, and um, I, I think this, this, this idea of de-escalation, right, and, and the mantra of de-escalation and turn down the temperature and we're just going to send signals. I mean, you know, what that means to the Iranians, the Supreme Leader hears this and he goes, oh, I have license to escalate on my own terms with impunity. Because we have to remember their strategy is to expend, if it takes, if this is what's necessary, every Arab life, every Palestinian life, uh, in their effort to drive us out of the region as, as, as step A to the step B of destroying Israel and killing all the Jews. I mean, that's really what they want to do. And so if, if you allow them to pursue that strategy without acting like, you know, you know what the return address is for this violence in the region, then they, they, have, they, they get away, you know, uh, get away with that strategy. So, so um, my piece to, uh, is, is largely ab about that. I mean, I, I don't, you know, uh, I don't want to attack Vice President Harris. I just want to say, I just said, hey, you know, she has to tell us more. So does President Trump, because I also criticized President Trump in the piece for being, for being erratic, you know, on, on some of his policies. So it's, I, I think in some ways, you know, it's a choice at the moment, unless Vice President Harris can make a break with some of the, the Biden administration's policies between inconsistency and the erratic nature of President Trump and what I would describe, especially in policy toward the Middle East, as, as a degree of fecklessness on the part of the uh, Biden administration. Uh, General McMaster has to leave in five minutes, so we have time for like one or two questions. Does anybody have a question? Uh, Amory Slaughter. Well, General McMaster, that was, I, I can't wait to read the book. Come, you know, come, can you bring the mic down, please? Yeah. Just so that way, that way the people online can hear your question. Thank you. So as I, I, I look forward to reading your book. Uh, my question is about strategic empathy and how far you'd apply it. Because when I lived in China for a year, one of the things I was most struck by is that for you know two millennia of Chinese history, the nation has fallen apart, been put back together, fallen apart, been put back together, and they are obsessed with unity. Yeah. So obviously, I want Taiwan to stay democratic, but. When you apply strategic empathy, you understand why she is so allergic to a declaration of independence. Mm -hmm. How much does that inform your thinking about how we engage with China? Right. So what, what we, we tried to do when we were laying the foundation for, for China policy is to distinguish between the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese people, to distinguish between the broad sweep of Chinese history and the party as it has existed since, you know, 1948, you know. Uh, since it's been in power to the, to the present. So, so uh, I, I was persuaded by that view. I didn't really know China. I'd never, uh, the only time I went to China was with President Trump on his, on his visit. So I rely quite heavily on Matt Pottinger, who's fantastic, you know, and I think is the person most responsible for laying that foundation for the shift in, in, in policy. And we, we were very clear about distinguishing between the party and the, and the Chinese people, and we have been since, I think, both of us and those of us who worked in the, others who worked in the, in the administration. Um, I'm also was quite, you know, persuaded by Frank Decoder's work on the, on the, on the uh, party. He has a five volume history of, of the party. So, you know, I, I, see the, I see the Chinese people as the greatest victims of the Chinese Communist Party, whereas the Chinese Communist Party would say they get credit you know, for the astonishing, you know, rise of China, you know, lifting so many people out of power, out of poverty, my interpretation is that that happened in spite of the party, because of because of the strength of, of, of Chinese society and the Chinese people. So I, I see the party as the problem, and the party I think, as you alluded to, I would agree completely, is obsessed with control, obsessed with control, and is fearful. I think the emotion is fear uh, of, of losing its exclusive grip on power. This is why they make they make decisions like don't make any sense to us, right? Zero COVID, right? The, the crackdown on the tech sector. But only when you consider the party is driven by this fear of losing control do those kind of decisions make sense. This is why I think we have to take the threat to Taiwan seriously and the threat to our treaty ally, the Philippines. 
where there were seven incidents of, of really, you could call them acts of war in, in the last month. This lady here. And we have uh, two minutes, so. We'll right, <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> short, short. HR Patty Morsey. Um, haven't seen you in a while. I got out of government, have my own company now. My question is, if you were to go back in as National Security Advisor for the Harris administration, let's say, um, what would you advise in terms of improving the U.S. and European um, and other allies' support to Ukraine? How can we help Ukraine win? Yeah. Okay, the, f the first thing would be a, you know, clarify our objectives, right? And make that explicit and talk about it all the time. Like a, you know, a free, independent, sovereign Ukraine that can defend itself and is back on the path toward, towards uh, prosperity. Uh, but to do that, then, what is necessary from a military perspective, military assistance perspective to the Ukrainians? I think they need two sort of gr sets of capabilities. One, to stop the onslaught against them. And the second is to, for them to be able to regain control of territory such that if there is a negotiated settlement, that settlement can occur, can, can, uh, can reach terms favorable to the Ukrainians and, and consistent with that overall political objective. I think that's what's missing now. So instead of what you have, when you don't have a clear concept, clear objectives, then you get people who, who are all mired in tactical details. Do we give them tanks or not tanks? F-16s or not F-16s? How many? You know, I mean, that's crazy, I think. And so once you have those, uh, those objectives in mind, then you can evaluate the degree to which the capabilities are adequate and the capacity, right? The, the scale of the advisory effort is sufficient to accomplish those objectives. That's what's missing. And then, and then if, there's a, if there's a clear gap in between what the objective is and what, what are the means that we're helping the, the, uh, uh, the Ukrainians um, uh, with, uh, th then I think you can understand better what's necessary. And we can do it. You know, I think we could... You know, we could provide them with the capabilities. I do believe that, I do believe Russia's weak. Ukraine has a lot of issues now, and if you saw the reporting today about morale issues and everything, I do worry about it. I've not been to Ukraine, I should say. Um, uh, you know, I've been relying quite heavily on people who, who visit there and talking to them. Uh, so I, I, I'm not saying it's a rosy picture on the side of the Ukrainians, but you remember, you know, look at the Wagner offensive toward Moscow, right? I mean, this is an ex-hot dog salesman, an ex-con, <laughs> <laughs> who marched on Moscow, shot down like seven aircraft. I mean, you know, so, and, and look at the, look at the, you know, look at the, the, the Kursk offensive. I mean, I, so anyway, I just think that, you know, we should stop taking counsel of our fears, stop allowing Putin to rattle the sa nuclear saber, uh, stop, again, this is the mantra of de-escalation and turning down the temperature or escalation management. When I, when I read the language of the administration on a lot of this, I mean, I, I think sometimes it's like, it's like, uh, you know, Robert McNamara throwing his voice, you know, in terms of graduated pressure in Vietnam, uh, or John McNaughton, or, or uh, you know, or William Bundy, you know, those who were penning the, the graduated pressure strategy for Vietnam. It doesn't work in war. Thank you very much, Lieutenant General. <laughs> thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Thanks.